Now, the next presenter, Dr. Christine Zhang. Um, so she, is, she has her private practice, and she is also an adjunct faculty at the University of San Francisco. Dr. Christine Zhang also has uh, been practicing as a licensed psychologist in California for more than seven years. She also teaches as an adjunct faculty in the clinical psychology PsyD program at University of San Francisco. She offers culturally informed deaf psychotherapy with specialties in anxiety, attachment, and intergenerational trauma, and issues related to immigration and minority experiences. In addition to clinical practice, Dr. Zhang also provides trainings and workshops focusing on con contemporary psychodynamic theory and practice, cultural decolonization, and Asian or Asian American well-being. So please join me and welcome Dr. Zhang. Hi everyone, um, before I start, I just want to invite um, everyone here, just take a moment, notice your body and the contact points with your surrounding. So notice the contact point between your back and your chair, and your butt and your chair, your feet on the ground, or not on the ground if you sit this way. And just take a moment, notice your body. And also take a moment, notice any openness right in this moment and any resistance at this moment. Just take a moment to notice that in you. I know we're in the middle of the uh, whole day learning and training, so I just really appreciate you all be here. And then one of the uh, main focus on my presentation is really noticing our body and the connection with the surrounding. That's why I invite you to just take a moment and notice yourself. Okay? All right. So um, I can just introduce my little, myself a little bit more. So I'm um, really happy to be here. Um, right now I have a full-time private practice and I also teach as an adjunct at the University of San Francisco. Before this, I've been working at um, University of California, Berkeley's Conference Center for six years. And I also um, serve as a collective supervisor at the Wright Institute and at Palo Alto University. So I've been around in the Bay, and then I noticed a lot of you all coming from the institution, so this feels really warm to me. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to look at there often because there's a clock on the wall, so I just want to make sure that I um, manage the time well. And then I also, just please excuse me, I may cough sometimes because I have very serious allergy today. Thank you. Um, so, my presentation will be mainly focused on what I do, what I say, what I see in clinical sessions client. I think a lot of time that um, when we say we provide acknowledgement and the validation, we assess the impact of the complex trauma, and we process emotional experience. I mean, we write those things in our notes, right? But what do we actually do in session with the client sitting in front of us? I think this is what I want to share with you all today more, okay? So the first thing I want to um, just remind myself and we us all is to slow down. And I think a lot of time that we rush into session because we're so excited and we're lo in loving with our clients, we want to work with them, want to know, we're curious, tell me more about your story. And we rush. And I think the point of working with complex trauma, especially in our community, is to slow down. What does slow down means is really take a breath. <sighs> really take a moment noticing what's coming up in this person sitting in front of me. So when I say track, subtle, and micro-expression, I mean um, what's going on on their face. A lot of time, clients are talking about uh, stories or narratives, and they say, I feel fine. 
there's a you know twitch here. There's story right here. They say they're fine. Yeah, I'm fine. I guess yeah. My mom said that I'm fine. There's story right here, right here. So that's what we want to track. That's why I want to. That's what we want to see. And then I would gently invite my client say, Ah, I noticed you did this. I don't know how to say that in English sometimes. I just do that at the same time. Yeah. And so I say, Notice something there. Notice on your, something on your eyebrow when you say that. So I reflected that back to my client and then invite them to notice their actual stories here. And then nowadays, all my prior practices online. So because um, you know it's a screen, I see most of their face. So actually, it's easier for us to notice the micro expression, and also whether they're breathing or not. This is something about neuroscience too. When people are talking about complex trauma experience, and when talking about something that's intense, they don't breathe. They hold the breath back. They're talking about this is what my mom did to me. And then they're not breathing. So it virtually, you know, you see the screen. You can see they're not really breathing. So that's what we're paying attention to. We not just pay attention to their narratives, their stories. Yes, we do that. But also we're paying attention to their facial, to their breath. Are they breathing? Because one thing about trauma work is talking about the trauma in the past, but also breathe in this moment. And that's how we rewire the brain. Okay, so that's a slow down, track, subtle, and a micro expression. The second thing I want to talk more is notice the function of psychological defense and honor it. And I think Christina was talking um, about this, and I really like what she presented just then. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples. I think right now in my practice, actually, in my year, seven years of practice, most of my clients um, are Asian, Asian identifies. And then a lot of time, you know, we're all clinicians here. We ask questions, how do you feel about this, right? How do you feel about X, Y, Z? That's our counseling skill 101, right? We ask how you feel. Clients say, I don't know. I don't know. How do I feel about what my mom did to me? I don't know, yeah. And so right there, there's something, there's something. So I would invite my client to say, well, I hear you say, I don't know. Can we take a moment here? Can we take a moment to slow down? Wow, what you just shared with me, what happened to you? Wow. So therapists, we slow down first. And then we're trying to assess, is this about they don't have language, they don't have the words to say what they feel, or it is nothing, there's numbness, there's nothingness, or some kind of emptiness that they experience, so they say, you know, they get a question, how do you feel? They say, I don't know. Yeah. And I think in my practice, I made it very clear when I, as a therapist, I ask, how do you feel about X, Y, Z thing? I'm not expecting any emotional words. I'm expecting a description. A lot of our clients answer that question with reasons. Oh, I feel, I feel this way. Oh, uh, I, feel, I feel bad. Okay, a lot of my clients say I feel bad. I'll just stop them right there because bad is not a feeling. Same thing with good. Good and bad are evaluation. You answer a feeling question with evaluation. That's Asian intergenerational trauma right there in that moment. So when they say, I feel good today, I feel bad today, no. <laughs> and then all my clients, seems like they learned that, they like call themselves saying that. So a lot of time they answer the question, how are you feeling with evaluation. A lot of times they answer the feeling question with reasons. Oh, because this happened, you know, Wednesday, yada yada things happened. Thursday, my parents did that to me. Wow, I'm happy to learn that. But I'm asking, how are you feeling? Yeah, and then you don't need to tell me emotional words. You don't need to know frustration. You need to know sadness. Sometimes people do that. But what I want to know is what's going on right here. And then so I would... Um, expand the, I guess, uh, the word bank for my client is when I ask how you feel, 
um, you can describe your feelings in colors. In is it soft? Is it hard? Is it big? Is it small? What's the size of it? Where is it you feel that? I feel sad. Okay, and then a lot of times with the therapist was like, okay, you feel sad. What's what, what? What do I continue? How do I continue? Right? But I would ask, how how do you feel about the sadness? Where is the sadness in you? Where's the sadness in your body? Or the sadness is above you, around you? I have client telling me that I feel she feels sad, and it's like a golf ball in her throat. You can imagine it's very vivid. If I have a golf ball in my throat, it's so painful. And it's right here. Stop all the energy, and it's really intense. So that tells me a lot of information rather than telling me the emotional word sadness. There's a golf ball in her throat. How painful that is! And then immediately I can relate. Okay. And so notice the function of psychological defenses. Meaning a lot of time clients are really. I feel numb. I don't feel anything. Just share with you. This is my intergenerational trauma. You ask me how I feel. I don't know. Okay. And let's really honor that I don't know. And let's really honor that numbness. Because that numbness, in theory, in psychological theories, it is a defense. And I would agree that. And also, it it is also a, um, a complex cultural trauma that's happening. Because we need that numbness, so I can put myself together, sitting right here. So I really want to invite my client to honor that numbness. I have client telling me she feel numb, and then I would again ask similar question: Where do you feel that numbness? Hmm, somewhere here. Okay, let's pay attention to that numbness right here. It seems like it's in your chest, and it's a left chest. Yeah. Notice the temperature. Notice the size. Notice um, is it getting bigger? The numbness getting bigger as we're paying attention to it, or it's getting smaller, or going somewhere else, going to somewhere else in my body, or going to somewhere else outside my body. So really explore that psychological defense in the way that we truly honor how that serves through generation in this client in front of me too. I'll share another example. I think、um, a lot of time clients come to session saying, "I ask how are you feeling as we start." That's how I usually start session. <coughs> and then my client, two clients this week, <laughs> say that I feel tired. Okay. And then both are working professionals, and then so they tend to, they tend to want to solve the tiredness, viewing tiredness as a problem. That I feel tired, but I need to work. I need to take care of my family. I need to do a lot of things. Help me not be tired. But tiredness is such a human experience, and so we really want to explore that tiredness. We want to give that tiredness space. And so I say, where are you feeling the most tiredness? My client, one of my clients, say、uh, eyelid. So she say, oh, this feels really heavy and tired. It makes sense, right? They watch the, <laughs> they see the screen the whole day. So it makes sense. And I think for a therapist, I invite her. Can we just close our eye for a moment in session, because it feels so heavy, and let's just close it. The other client is like, "Ah,、oh, I really want to just lie down." So we're again, we're doing virtual work here. The client say, "Can I just do this on my desk?" I say, "Of course, of course. Can I do that with you too?" So I, you know, move my camera a little bit, and so we do this together. Yeah! Wow! So heavy! So tired! It has been a whole week. You've done so much. This is overwhelming. Wow! And so we really give that body experience some space because they have done a lot. Take care of themselves and other people. And so what I'm trying to say is, tiredness. A lot of time, people want to fix it. Anger. People want to manage that. A lot of emotional experience. People want to get rid of it, and yet, to me, emotional experience, processing emotional experience, meaning that we ride the emotions. When we ride emotions, 
there is a natural start and a natural end. Okay, so that's what I tell my clients too. All right, let's continue. So, um, as I say, I think a lot of time we notice a psychological defense. This is also uh, cumulative intergenerational trauma that's been presented in this person in front of me. And so we honor the defense. We, we notice the defense, you know, because we're training um, as a therapist, we notice the defense, we want to work and address defense, and yet, we want to honor what the defense has done to us. And then for our community, in my experience, talking about feelings, talking about emotions, just allow feelings to have a space, to have a voice. It's an everyday decolonization already. When I ask my parents how they feel, they're like, I don't know what this question means. You're a psychologist, you ask this question all the time. And so, I think it's everyday decolonization for us that we just pay attention to feelings. Because over the years, over the generations, feelings are not allowed. Feelings are dangerous. And even nowadays, if you talk about feelings, I'm angry at certain government, this is not allowed. You'll be shut down. You'll probably be jailed, put in jail, you'll probably die, get gone, disappear. So when you talk about your subjective, Feelings. Oh, I feel so powerless. I feel so angry. It's not allowed, even nowadays. So really allow the client, because I work as a psychologist, uh, therapist, allow the client to allow and invite them to have a space for their feelings and emotions. It is an everyday decolonization for our community already. Okay. Next one. Okay, so, and I think in uh, complex trauma work, uh, we talk a lot about how foster self-care, foster, you know, healthy social support, and then relationships with others. And so in our community, what does that look like? Okay, so address feelings of guilt, shame, and anger at the self. A lot of time, we have a um, client talking about self blame self-criticism, self-judgment, self-doubt. Oh, to me, anger right there. But the anger made a U-turn. I'm angry at myself. It is my fault. I didn't do X, Y, Z thing, or I dumped too much. Okay? So this is an anger that didn't go complete its course. Made a U-turn at itself. And there are reasons. Because people or the... Um, recipients there are not taking the anger or there's no no one no one's over there so there's a lot of reason people redirect the anger at itself and it becomes what we hear in session the self-blame self-doubt self-criticism all that so when I hear that there's an emotion right there I want to bookmark for my client is anger when you blame yourself, there's anger didn't complete its course. Can we look at that? And that's what I invite my client to do. So address the feeling of guilt, shame, and anger at itself. The next one is grief and loss. The loss of identity, safety, trust, time that has passed, opportunity in the past, and even a part of the self. I think this is so important and it's so scary for a lot of clients, including us too. Because for us to acknowledge there is a loss in a part of you, it's heartbreaking. Whether the trauma is coming from intergenerational oppression, coming from racism, coming from a lot of hurtful message and behaviors, to recognize, wow, I'm hurt and wounded and the part of me is gone, or time has gone, opportunity has gone. This is a lot for a client and for us too. And sometimes, me as a therapist, I don't want to acknowledge there's a loss either. So I think that's where, our, uh, where we need to pay attention to our conflict transference. Okay? And I want to just um, 
share with you one uh, analogy that I like to share with my client is feeling, address feelings, uh, including the grief and sadness. It's like climbing the mountain. Okay? So a lot of time, for example, anger. I feel angry, I feel angry, I feel angry. I shouldn't feel angry at my mom because I'm grateful. She has done a lot for me. Okay, so you didn't finish this mountain. You actually made it, you turn here. So you didn't really complete the course of the emotional experience. Okay, sometimes I, I'm angry, I feel the anger. Yeah, my mom done so much for me, but I'm so angry that she said this right now. And then, ah, uh, never mind, it's so tired to be angry. Okay, made the U-turn again. Okay, so to, the, to this nervous system, this emotional experience never been completed. And so that has a very serious health implication right here. Because just stuck in your nervous system that you didn't complete right the wave of the emotions. And then I'm telling my client, all my client this, there's something so different, so different at the other side of the mountain. So we're climbing the mountain. Yes, there might be a peak or a few peaks that's so unbearable. So in, that, in the peak, stay with me, I'm with you. I'm with you there. We have ways to regulate the peak, make it a little bit more bearable, but we do want to complete the course of the emotional experience, which is the benefits for client to get the other side of the mountain and then feel that sense of relief, feel that sense of ah, release. And it doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to make it up with my mom, I mean, we love each other, or, you know, like we get close, we love each other. No, no, it means this is emotional experience, it's not a communication skill class. So this mountain climbing is an internal emotional experience that I want my clients, especially in our community, to experience that and actually experience the power of it. Okay. And then in session, because our goal for complex trauma work is to foster social support and healthy relationships, is I would like my client to experience relating with the here and now with their body, with the chair, like I invite you all to feel it. And with me, with the therapist. How do you relate to your therapist? Yeah, I think when I was a trainee, um, there were times that my clients say, thank you so much, Christine, I you know, um, feel better a lot working with you, thank you. I learned to say, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> You have done so much work, you have, you know, you work so hard, you come to session, really open, great, true, true. But in the attachment and relationship context, when clients say thank you, I want to say, yeah, I'm so glad to hear that. Because I want to help complete that cycle of gratitude. I don't want them to experience rejection again. And this is hard for Taiwanese woman like me, because people say thank you, I'm like, no, 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 I, it's all on you. No, so it really takes me a lot of moments to say, ah, oh, yes, we did this together. Yes, you're very welcome. I feel so privileged to be in this journey with you. And I thank you for telling me how grateful you are, because I see your progress and healing too. It really takes me a lot of moments to like complete that cycle, to model what relating really means and look like to client. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so the next one is, well, to me it takes two dots to draw a line. This is almost like a physics, not psychology anymore, it's physics. It takes two dots to make a line, okay? And it takes two individuals to form a relationship. The purpose of individuation is to connect. I think a lot of time when we learn about individualism and collectivism, we're like, yeah, we're collectivism. I am my mom, my mom is me. Yes, but there's no relationship if this is, this is what's happened, okay? I want to have a close 
loving relationship with my mom. But first, we need to be two dots so we can form that connection. And I think a lot of time people are um, hesitate to talk about boundary. So do I. I think boundary is such a hard concept for me growing up. There's no boundary. And then, so what I learned about boundary nowadays is boundary is a way to understand each other, understand what you like, understand what you don't like understand how I can be accommodating or the place that I'm not able to be that accommodating. So boundary is a bridge, not a wall. Okay, so to me, that is the point of individuation. I think in a very traditional psychoanalytical or psychodynamic theory, we heavily focus on individuation and people start to realize that's not applied in many other community. And yet, only two dots can form a line. Yeah, but we want a close line. We want a different line. We, I have to be and actually become myself, become the self first, so I can get to know you, so you can get to know me, so we can be together. Okay. So um, the last piece of um, clinical intervention, working with complex trauma folks, <clears throat> is to foster empowerment. I think all of us here know that, you know, all above is empowerment. So become politically active or not, filing a complaint or not, telling the stories or not, all above is empowerment. I want the client, I want the people to make decisions for themselves that feels the most comfortable. Sometimes different from how I would do, but that's one of my client's choice and I want to honor, respect, and really celebrate that. Celebrate even the silence. Celebrate that, wow, you hold your story together. I'm so glad I'm one of the few audience to hear your story, but really honor that, okay? And so what we do in session, is to release and then return the intergenerational burden and recognize intergenerational resilience. I think here I can share a little bit about myself. Um, so from, <clears throat> so when I left UC Berkeley's counseling center to start my own private practice, I had a tremendous amount of fear. And that fear is irrational. <laughs> my fear is I'm going to be live on the street without food and without shelter and you know that kind of irrational fear and I'm very perplexed by that because I'm a licensed psychologist. I think I you know no matter how much money I make, um, it the fear in my mind is things like very extreme. And I think in my internal work I realize that fear is not just my fear. Yes, I have fear that I don't have enough clients, not making enough money, yes. But the, that fear also coming from my parents, also coming from their parents, also coming from probably further generations. That fear, that fear of no food, no shelter, at war, and nowhere to go. And that's my grandparents' experience. And so I realized, ah, that's not my fear. And I think that moment, I feel very, um, I feel very inspired and touched in that moment, in that realization. I think I decided, of course, it's always therapy and supervisor and all that. Um, I decided to return that back to them because that's just, that's not my fear, that's their fear, whether they're alive or not. And then, because we're someone who is, who, um, we're someone who is integrity, so I don't take other people's back, right? I don't steal your backs, so why do I steal and take their burden and fear? So just put it back at them. Yeah. And so I, I still have my own fear that I don't have enough client. That's my fear I need to own. But there's also fear that doesn't belong to me, so I put it back. And then in that process, I realized, wow, even my parents, they have so much fear themselves and on me. They decide to come to the state without like, knowing anything in English and all that. I'm like, how brave that is. 
that is, wow, like I don't want to move to German or France because I don't speak the language, why would I go there? And I know no one there. So I think in the process of returning that fear back to whoever owns it, I realize there's resilience that, wow, there is courage too. Last one is so where there is intergenerational burden, there's always intergenerational resilience. Okay, this is um, being inspired by Michel Foucault. I think she, uh, he's one of my favorite sociologists. He said, where there's power, there's resistance. And so where there's burden, we just notice there's also resilience. I just want to share that with you all. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now it's like five minutes for Q&A. If you have any questions for Dr. Zhang, please raise up your hand. And the microphone will be right in front of you. I'm curious, um, could you tell us more about the actual process of separating out fear from that's either, that's not your fear, it's someone else's fear, whether it's a client, yourself, what does the actual separating process actually look like? What are the steps that you go through, that you either go through with your clients, or how can you know we as people sort of not only understand that uh, conceptually, but actually do it? I just really appreciate your hand gesture, because that's what I do in session too. So what she did is separating the fear this way. Okay, I'll do it with a microphone. Okay, so uh, me as a client, because the example I gave is about myself. Okay, so I, you know, I have fear about leaving this job that I no longer feel satisfied, and I know I want to do something differently. So this is so clear in my prefrontal cortex, but I feel tremendous amount of fear. And that fear, again, in clients' understanding is something that's just additional, something that's just more than, you know, change career, <laughs> fear, uh, worry about I don't have clients, that kind of anxiety, it's much more than that. So that tells us therapists that there's something else. So the process will look like, let's just slow it down, let's slow it down. You feel the fear, let's feel the fear together. And let's slow it down and really notice your fear, your fear of not having enough client, right? And there's something else. And then, again, to me, my own experience is just like magic. <laughs> so when I do that with my mentor, my supervisor, my therapist, it's actually this realization is coming from a training, a conference, <laughs> yeah. And so um, I just feel like, wow, what's being separated out? It's not my fear. They're just not mine. They're real. It feels real, it feels heavy, health feels consuming. It's real, but it's not mine. And then what comes to my mind is my parents, their fear. Because in fact, after I quit UC Berkeley, they didn't talk to me for a month. So <laughs> they really hate me leaving that stable job. Okay, so <laughs> that's their fear. And then I can, I understand, you know, their, both of their parents hold a lot of fear too, in survival. And so in this, in session, I do this a lot. Even just ask the client to look at the hand gesture. Something's different, something's not, something's not here. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciated how you um, really kind of just, you know, ex extended the whole experience, like the whole, you know, around the emotional uh, experience. 
and how I think, you know, you're right, a lot of times we, you know, just internally, even with ourselves, we're having an experience, uh, emotional experience, and then all these, you know, inner voices, whether it's from our parents or from our, from our past or from what, you know, it's all interjecting and kind of creating these kinds of barriers yes. from being able to kind of, you know, get through to the other side to kind of experience what that is, you know, to that breakthrough, right? Yes. Um, so, so I, I appreciated that and then how, you know, uh, and I would even take it further with the intergenerational, like the interdevelopmental mm -hmm. that I found for myself, like I'm having experience and realizing, wait a minute, as I started to kind of stretch it out that this is experience I had when I was nine. Yes. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, it just kind of, and then you can take it further to then, you know, your, you know, other generations. Mm -hmm. But when you start to do that, you also find yourself connecting with it. Yes. And then honoring it. Yes. Because you realize, you know, I did that when I was nine because I was just trying to survive. Yes. I was trying to get through a really difficult experience and I didn't have the support at the time to get through it. Yes. But I don't have to do it now anymore, but yes, you know, that's what I had to do when I was nine. Yes. You know, or that's what my parents had to do to survive being yes. an immigrant. Yeah. But I don't have to do that now. But, but it's that kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, conversation that you have with those parts of yourself mm -hmm. to be able to kind of, you know, to to allow it to be where it needs to be versus carrying it with you. Like, it's almost like you're carrying a trail. Yes. You're going through your life and then you get to this point. You're like, oh my gosh, look at this long trail. And yes. It's carrying it all from a thing and it can go back generations. So, yeah. you know, so yeah, it just kind of um, elicited all those kinds of, of thoughts and experiences. So thank you for inspiring me. Oh, of course. Thank you. Yeah. It's just uh, so lovely to see that in the, what she just described, there's just a lot of beautiful um, grieving experience, separating experience, and also a lot of integrating experience that, you know, right now, I feel the chair, I feel my desk, I feel my surrounding, I'm growing up. And I also notice, well, my nine-year self has that experience and that own sending. So we really separate this too and then starting to grieve that, start to um, not just under, yes, understand and also grieve and then process that feeling. Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah. Oh, okay. I will go this one first and then go the next. I'll be around too. <laughs> I can ask you later if you want. <laughs> I'm Irene. I'm from Aging House Services. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation, and I can see all the movement and all the um, the emphasis on seeing the patients in person and like actually gesturing all of these things and asking them to feel it somatically. Um, but you know, with uh, the pandemic and stuff, it led up to a lot of people staying inside. Yes. And then technological barriers, you might not even see them over video. Mm -hmm. So, so much, so many appointments have moved over the phone. Yes. And so, I'm um, wondering if you have any experiences or any tips to, that you use to accommodate that mm -hmm. when you can't see the individual mm -hmm. and you're not hearing them breathe or talk anymore. Mm -hmm. They're not engaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how are you? Um, yeah, tweaking everything to fit those. I have clients um, right now, even though they're working professionals, they want to do that over the phone for many different reasons. So I have clients uh, stay on the phone with me. Um, I think in that situation, it's a challenge to really slow down more. Because on the phone, people are like wanting to tell a story. So, this is what happened. Yeah, you Take a moment. <laughs> Take a moment. Well, I'm hearing a lot. So the way I speak on the phone session, I speak even slowly, slower. I mean, in person, I may do this, and, but on the phone, really, wow. Really, like when they're talking, I ins almost insert myself. Mm -hmm. Like really to slow them down. I mean, take you to slow down because I know you're on the phone, you want to, hey, yeah, wow. So I think that's a challenge. It is a challenging, and especially challenging in the slowing down process. Yeah. Oh, do we, uh, this is the last question. Okay, last one. <coughs> Hi, Dr. 
Zhang, really fascinating presentation. Um, I'm curious, so I'm a, like a new therapist, still a trainee, and I was really fascinated by your description of how people write emotional experiences and then quit in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think even including myself, I do that a lot. Do. So, and I think would, to help our clients write their emotional, um, a full cycle of your, their emotions, we should do as much as we can. So I wonder if you have any tips in how we can like facilitate or help ourselves try to stay in the emotional cycle mm -hmm. as, as to try to finish it as much as possible. Yes. Yeah. So quickly I can say I think the thing that helps me the most because I share that fear too. I myself so many emotional mountains I climb a half I'm like no. <laughs> so I think what helps me the most is really a deep trust. A trust in the process. We therapists talk about it's a process all the time. <laughs> It's a process. Everything's a process. Yes, it is a process. <laughs> I think for me, what helps the most is the trust that process. Like I don't have that much confidence in trusting myself, but I have trust in that process. I have to trust that through that process, there is something. There's something there waiting for me that I don't know, that I'm curious, I'm scared, but curious to know. And so that trust. Sometimes people will say, I don't I trust? Yes, and I'll tell them, I've been there. I've done my work. I think it's important for therapists to ongoingly doing our own work. Um, is to, I've been there. I've been like, after the peak of the emotional experience, there is a completion, there is a relief. There is like, oh, yeah, that's done. I need to think about my relationship with my mom, for example. But my anger becomes a relief. I mean, oh, what, what's actually the relationship like? It's a different story, but I feel differently internally. So I myself have that experience. I trust that experience, and I share that trust with my client. Yeah, and then a lot of time climbing that mountain, one thing I say very often is stay with me. Stay with me, even in the virtual setting. My client's like, oh my goodness, I don't want to. Okay, stay with me. Can you hear my voice? Do you look at my eyes? Stay with me. Yeah, so we're using relationship as an anchor in that mountain climbing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.